good morning everyone thanks for coming and uh, we welcome to the session on challenge to the limit in cataract surgery i am dr minu mathan please matthew matthew kuren is the co chair person we are we both are co chair persons so this is planned as a video session alone and uh, panel discussion so we have uh, six eminent panelists very high volume surgeons and highly experienced surgeons so they will comment on all these uh little difficult situations and uh, troubled uh, uh, conditions where we may face um we, we may face problems but there are different ways to solve these problems so we both will be showing different ways of solving uh, a single problem and then we'll discuss other ways and the finer modifications so let me introduce uh, the panelists uh, first uh, dr S sony george please 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 come out to the podium please so he is a um, very senior cataract surgeon phaco surgeon from uh, cochin and uh, now dr jay prasad b he is one of my teachers also a very senior phaco surgeon one of the pioneers in kerala welcome sir and uh, professor s venkatesh so he is another senior teacher and a prolific surgeon very innovative techniques so and i will let matthew introduce the rest of the panelists please so it's my privilege to introduce uh, to all of you uh, dr soumya nanaya she is uh, cataract surgeon based out of uh, kurg uh, she runs the lopamudra i center there dr varun kharbanda from alabad uh, mahesh netralya and uh, dr mukesh paryani from neovision in pune so all three uh, have been long associated with me and i've had the privilege to be uh, involved with them for the last 5 uh, 7 years and i know that they are fantastic surgeons with good insights which they'll share with you thank you so uh, without uh, we uh, declare that both of us have no financial interest in any of what we show here so first we'll take up hard cataracts small pupil and uh, my way of doing SICS in this, so it's not that only SICS can be done. I will be showing SICS. Matthew will show FACO. So this is one very black and a small pupil. So very hard cataracts. I still feel SICS has a role. And here the use of iris hooks. So these are the iris hooks which I use, made from uh, uh, sold by Alcon, and even Oralab also makes it. Uh, no financial interest on that. so to make a large rexus that is what i need them for so pupil is dilated as much as possible up to 6 mm 7 mm and get a 6.5 to 7 mm rexus for the size of the pupil which we a uh, nucleus which we have in here so staining is very crucial because we don't get much red glow with this and one uh, hook as you can see is from the floor floor of the tunnel so after making the tunnel through the floor of the tunnel we make put one one hook and open up so after that make a large rexus then if you want we can do a little bit of hydro dissection most of these cases don't need hydro dissection and i use a sinski to prolapse there are different ways of prolapsing the nucleus so uh, up to what you feel is good for you, with you and the incision has to be really large this is an 8.5 inner lip and my uh, sub incisional hook is gone now so just just to create space there you can because otherwise there, there is crowding in the anterior chamber that is the main problem with hooks being laid in the anterior chamber so here what we i would suggest is to make a limbal paracentesis rather than corneal paracentesis go close to the limbus and a stab wound not through the cornea too much so that it doesn't pull up the iris the tenting is avoided and after that like a regular case we need to use viscoat and other um, dispersive viscoelastics when you are prolapsing and uh, taking out the nucleus here you can see that almost 180 degrees is out and the rest is mobile it's rotated from the back so that means you can put in your vectus and get the rest of it out you don't don't have to completely rotate it into the bag also and these three hooks we can actually release them once we have done a big rexus and the one pole is out we can release those hooks also and then have the iris fall back and have enough space for this nucleus to lie inside the anterior chamber because these are very huge nuclei which will fill up the whole chamber uh, the iris and the hooks there can sometimes be troublesome especially if you are using very thick large hooks which are made by some companies which i don't use for these kind of cases and once that is done the uh, nucleus can be delivered out like in any other regular case i am stabilizing the globe with a rectus suture we can or not have up to you to stabilize the globe but stabilization is very important and after this again if you want you can get the hook back in 
all the hooks back in because we want to see the rexus margin you want to get these chunks of cortex which may be stuck in the periphery to be taken out completely and see the rexus margin to place the iole in the back so if you are placing any type of iole you can place and these incisions if made well they do not induce too much of astigmatism maximum of 0.5 or a maximum of 0.75 i do all temporal so temporal uh, most of the patients have against oral astigmatism and works well in such cases and the uh, case is completed so after matthew shows his case we will have a discussion on this so we will plan to show around six uh, scenarios and then have around 12 13 minutes of uh, each this one and finish off okay okay so okay. now today we have a lot of uh, lovely devices uh, in order to do the procedure and the b hex is a innovation which comes out of india it's a small uh, ring which can be introduced through even a sub 2 mm incision i have been using the forceps itself i prefer to hook the distal flange alternate flanges need to go under the iris and i prefer to hook the distal flange first then for me because i am right handed the left flange alternate flange goes under the iris this is a slightly older model uh, but it works very well with uh, the iris uh, the micro rexus forceps and uh, i i'll tell you why i prefer the micro rexus forceps and last and final is the most challenging one but if you see i have actually now rotated the iris a little uh, the hooks a little bit so that the from my position on the right side uh, side port i am able to hook it the sub incisional area without too much of difficulty so the ease of using the micro rexus forceps is that i can then without interruption proceed with using the uh, forceps for my rexus as well and with approximately a 5 mm opening uh, it is very easy to complete the phaco uh, one limitation of the Uh, device is that it needs to be a fairly deep chamber and even if you are using a bulky iol like uh, the ao over here bosch and lomb ao no financial interest there the iris hook uh, uh, iris uh, is remaining well dilated and i use under irrigation the micro rexus forceps again to dislodge the proximal sub incisional uh, hook from under the iris and then i just withdraw it out and the procedure it's very easy to do that uh the alternative is to use hooks and it's important at this stage to uh use a sub incisional hook and this is critical because otherwise each time we are while doing phaco introducing the phaco port this one is uh, right under the uh main port so this is critical because that is what gives us the space to do the phaco there and uh, it's a little more cumbersome to introduce the hooks these are the thicker hooks that we know was talking about and five ports are required typically i use at least uh, four if not five in most situations and uh, we can then proceed with phaco once the the technical challenge associated with the surgery is eliminated once the hooks are in position and then you can proceed with surgery and uh, at the end of surgery again under irrigation typically is uh, where i remove the hooks just make sure that you follow the curvature of the hook while removing it and don't yank the iris and damage the stroma of the cornea while removing the hooks we'll go on to the discussion uh, related to this case while i will show you my last video let it play it's when you are feeling a little lazy you can just uh, proceed with a very small as long as the pupil is big enough to allow the phaco tip to go in you can uh, do that one comments or uh, queries i think, yeah, uh, I think we'll uh, we'll start on with this uh, this one we'll this one playing on the background let it hold so um, uh, sics i think uh, everybody is doing sics here or have you given up sics so okay uh, 
yeah please switch on your mic so that uh, this can be heard to uh, everyone yeah, so I, uh, uh, madam what yeah, what do you I, say I'm yeah in small pupils up. sics uh, the one which you the case which you saw uh what what do you do differently and what do you think can be better is so first of all you have made it so easy i think you know in like real life for many of us it might not be as beautiful as that you know it it would be much more challenging and especially because um, i think we we are all a generation um uh you know after, come closer closer okay, to the sorry. mic because it's getting yeah, recorded yeah. yeah because you've all had so much more exposure to sics i think that the beauty and that flow is absolutely wonderful uh with time i think many of us are getting more comfortable with feco so um for me i would i would feel like feco is a safer situation you know with such a, a small pupil because um, also because like you said you know that the chance of engaging the iris when the pupil is so small and we would have to kind of take off the hook sub incisional hook and then that iris it always has some problem of dialysis or engaging it at some point but you have made it look look absolutely easy but for many of us who don't have those kind of sics volumes behind us because now we routinely do more feco i think it would be very challenging and uh, but what i uh, wanted to ask was uh, do you use uh, rings for sics because that maybe the tenting up is lesser what for sics uh, small pupil do you use rings and rings no SICS? not at all rings cannot be used for this one so yeah. the point is that if you want to bring out a nucleus larger than 6 mm it will drag on the uh, yeah. rings also yeah. so rings is absolutely not possible in uh, sics and so hooks are the only options which you can use but other ways are there we know that we can do stretch you can do uh, retract the iris and do a larger excess underneath and all those things but this is one i feel this is a very safe option so that i just uh, relax after putting the hooks and la large pupil relax and then do the rest any any more comments it's not just the pupil it's also the hard cataract so with this level of grade 5 uh, to 6 uh, hard cataract you get uh, much clearer corneas with small incision cataract surgery having said that uh, i still AV, AV, prefer please. to do feco because um, with the use of adequate dispersive viscoelastics we can coat the endothelium well and with respect to small pupil i have just two comments to make if the pupil is 4 and 1/2 mm or more then and if it is not a very soft or hard cataract i really don't think a pupil dilating device is needed and with a direct feco chop i'm able to get by most of the time but the dangerous ones are the soft ones and the hard ones in which case i will definitely use a pupil dilating device so my choice was when i started using these devices it was the malogen ring the scrolls are very comfortable and there was a ready injector system Uh, in which uh, at one go i could engage like three scrolls and i just had to pop in the fourth so now there is another device called the gupta ring which is uh, also now what That's i think is comfortable yeah. and uh, affordable and very economical yes uh, only please uh, thanks uh, minu for uh, to invite us here uh, both of you have very elegantly uh, presented your cases and uh, as always the technique in which you are more comfortable should be the technique to adopt and a few things to say i would look at the age of the patient if it is a very old patient with a very likely see with a small pupil it will be very difficult to uh, diagnose a subluxation uh, in these cases so if it is a older patient i would always go with the sics that will be a much safer option and much clearer cornea the corneal endothelium will not be so sics a uh, sm- slightly larger wound like uh, dr minu said uh, that will be excellent and the use of iris hooks like uh, he said the grishaba hooks are much thinner for feco it may not be really a problem but uh, these are slightly more difficult to insert but uh, very small and uh, less space consuming and uh, uh, once you uh, uh, do that and uh, you you there is hardly any uh, stress on the zonules so it is a much better option if it is an older patient in a younger patient probably with a hard brown nucleus you can go ahead with feco uh, like how matthew has described one quick point uh, the advantage of using hooks especially when there is a suspected uh, zonal zonal laxity zonalopathy is that you can then release the iris and hook on the capsular bag mm. any time during surgery so you don't not you don't need to have a separate device at that stage if you have done rings then you need to introduce hooks or some capsular bag stabilization device if there is a zonalopathy 
So you said you would say why you would use the microlexis forceps itself for the so yeah. because now I I have found that some sometimes when I use the BHX ring with this, these tips are very sharp. Yes. And if I hold like this, it is fine. Mm. But if it turns, if you have to turn a little bit, no, it you can very close size. to the capsule. Yeah. So there so, is a, there are forceps which they also give. We also have which yeah. are flat tipped and the tip is rounded and smooth. Yeah. So uh, I prefer it because then I just enter once, uh, engage the ring. And then continue with that. I don't come out and uh, switch uh, instruments. That's all. So have say. visco underneath the under, yes, there, there uh, underneath the iris first. Have space and don't tilt the tip down when you, if you have sharp pointed tips like this when you use this. Yes, madam. Uh, do you think there is any role for any eye cams like intracameral uh, anesthetic these kind of things? Yeah, it depends on because what type of pupil you are dealing with is what we should assess first. You know, rigid ones, pseudo exfoliation ones, which do not move, do not dilate, nothing happens with uh, whatever midriatic you use. But then uh, many patients just come up on table without getting dilated fully outside. So that is what happens in most of the some uh, slightly larger volume or whatever. So if the pupil moves when you are putting saline or visco, and if you feel that you see a lot of movement of the iris initially itself, then it's always worth to use right. intracameral dilating uh, phenocaine kind of no financial interest on that phenocaine or your diluted adrenaline and see whether it dilates see uh, no harm done but then some people are against it because they don't want anything inside the anterior chamber which will influence the endothelium and all those things but then in compromised situations we have to use additional adjuvant which 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 are all required and then because of want of time i think we'll uh, yeah yeah yes would you consider a specular microscope in yeah Preoperatively, yeah. We do specular microscopy for all cataract patients. Yeah. All cataract patients we do, but I would suggest if you have it, do it especially for these kind of hard ones and very bad ones. Okay. And so the choice of viscoelastic, uh, no financial interest there again, viscoat or anything else which has got that particular combination. So you know, financial interest, Oralab also makes uh, um, same a uh, viscoat kind of combination. Which works very very well, and it is it was uh, viscoat uh, or a coat plus plus or a coat and or a coat plus or a coat usually just washes off faster, but or a coat plus stays on for much longer time. You can re uh, reuse it use it again uh, and fill up the chamber in between and have uh, Doctor, very good. Doctor, you know, there is this iris hooks itself, right? There are two types uh, based on the stopper. The ones which uh, you showed were the flat ones. Mm. So, uh, I would like to tell some of the youngsters that there are two ones. The other one is the rounded one. So, the rounded one is very difficult to handle yes, because when works. you hold on to it and you go in, it gets it keeps, keeps uh, talking around inside. So, insist and get the flat ones because it's aligned to the curve. You just have to hold it and put it. It's so, it just makes it so much more easier. Really curved yeah. And, uh, you know, one yes, more point. Yes, so basically two situations where I do SICS in heart cataracts if it is black and two is of course the endothelial cell count is low. Specular I do for all patients and if it is low I will always uh, go in for SICS with a large incision, lot of uh, dispersive OVD. Uh, I use Oracle, no financial interest. And, um, and that sub-incisional uh, hook, um, you know, I generally put further behind from the sclera I go and keep it there throughout the procedure. I don't take it out and then go in and again reintroduce. That's one difference that I uh, usually do. And then uh, iris hooks for f uh, FACO, I think it's not necessary to dilate, I mean, bring it up to the limbus. I can keep it like your B-hex ring, just keep it at six so that you will leave behind a sphincter which is norm near normal and we'll have a round pupil. These are the comments I'd like to make. If I could. Yeah, please. No. So, uh, what I feel is that when you are doing SICS in such cases and you're using hooks, for, so a lot of time what happens is a pupil that is rigid and not dilating, once you've put the hooks, it has a little bit of mid dilated effect even if you remove the hooks. So, the advantage with SICS is whenever you put anything intracameral, it reduces the uh, area of your work, be it FACO, be it SICS. But in SICS, as soon as your excess is done, like you removed your sub incisional one, you can actually sometimes remove all the hooks so that you get a good area. And then in the end, when you want to do a wash like you did, you can you can play around with how long you leave the hooks inside and how easy or difficult you make the SICS for yourself. So I think SICS has that slight advantage because in FACO, you have to have them inside. And it's like operating a hyperopic patient because you're uh, chamber depth is a little less. When SIC is going to actually do away with the hooks if the pupil maintains a certain uh, mid-dilated diameter. And then once the excess is done, most of the things become slightly easier. 
And Matthew, is there more inflammation and more pigment release with BHX ring compared to iris hooks? No, I have not noticed that. Because uh, actually, when you are introducing or removing, you see a lot of pigment. Actually, it released. looks like that. When you are taking it out, you see a lot of uh, iris pigments coming along with this. That is true. But uh, um, iris hooks, you lose a lot at the at the points. But the other areas, it doesn't. But this one uh, tends to bring a little more of uh, iris hooks out along pigment. with it. That's what we have been seeing. That's true. <laughs> so, we move on to the next one, zonular dialysis. We'll have zonular dialysis. I'll, I'll show continuing, he'll show convert. So, this is one case where I was called in, in between by another surgeon telling that there is a lot of movement here, this part of the sun, pupil was mid dilated, couldn't see much, but then if you tap on the lens, there was slight tilt and movement, but the equator was not seen, so I thought it was not a big deal. So, I just put iris hooks on the uh, uh, iris rexus margin, so that's what I do, I am comfortable with that, but sometimes it comes off because it is shorter. So, the longer ones which will go till the equator will be a better ones to use in this. But then uh, look for vitreous. So, if you have vitreous and if you can see your senior enough, you can see it very clearly, then you don't have to stain. But otherwise, better stain with um, a triamcinolone and see, look for vitreous before uh, continuing it. So, I find a small strand here going on, especially going on to the incision and the paracentesis. And then don't shallow the chamber have visco inside and the area of dialysis can be plugged with uh, viscoat or or a coat and having a full nucleus inside the bag actually gives a traction or a push at the area of dialysis and doesn't let the bag move too much so i complete the chopping fully and then take out the pieces so i don't empty the bag uh, initially and after that it was going on very well so now you can see that there is cortex i have not put in the ctr i have just waiting i thought it was it will be difficult to get in the ctr with the whole nucleus inside now I to take out the hooks and dilate the pupil to see what is going on. See, I see the rexus margin, which is not very clear here. I show you, it looked like that. And it was so nice. And the iris hooks <laughs> attracted everything. And it was uh, so good. So I thought we'll just go ahead. There was just a feel of little small. See now what happens. See when I'm aspirating the uh, visco, see the bag coming out. So this much, almost five clock hours of, of dialysis was there, which I would not, I did not realize because the nucleus was filling the bag and I was not letting it come out because of repeated injection of viscoelastic also. So visualization in a, in a dialysis is very, very important. Peripheral dialysis will just remain hidden and then only we'll realize it. So once this is done, this was an intra-operative thing, not a progressive one. So four to five clock hours still, maybe... Uh, we don't have to suture, but then uh, assess according to the stability of the IOL and uh, the preoperative condition. If there was no predisposing condition, I will just let the CTR go in. I, I usually use the side uh, paracentesis opposite to the area of dialysis and get it into the bag. Now I use a micro forceps also to hold the trailing end and place it directly into the capsular bag through the paracentesis. And the IOL goes into the bag and you can use even a three-piece IOL in the sulcus and capture it in the uh, rexus, provided the rexus is very central and it is small enough for the capture. So over to you, Matthew. So here we are going to have a situation where this is a elderly 85 year old lady uh, with a little back problem and so she cannot uh, lie down for too long. So hard cataract, uh, I have stained, reasonable dilatation but see that jerk there second time. I decide at this stage with this hard cataract it is not a safe option to proceed with SIC, uh, FACO and I decide to convert to SICS. My rexus was small, adequate for FACO, but is inadequate to prolapse this uh, nucleus into the anterior chamber. So I do a double rexus. My favorite micro rexus forceps comes back into action. Uh, enlarge it. A slightly eccentric uh, rexus is desirable because then that side the pole will prolapse up. Okay. So again, good quality viscoelastic. Uh, remember, I have got only a 2 millimeter uh, incision at this stage. So, that needs to be converted uh, also. Okay. And uh, having completed my double rexis, this is now approximately 6.5, 6 plus millimeters, 6 millimeters or so. It is adequate to prolapse this. I use a double uh, technique. I use one in uh, Sinsky hook through the side port. The eccentric area of the rexis is used to prolapse that pole first. Then... Uh, using either one or uh, two instruments. Uh, you can use the second instrument to 
sort of balance the nucleus on, reduce the zonal stress and then prolapse the nucleus out of the bag. Good quality viscoelastic is very important at this stage again. The once the nucleus is out of the bag, phase 1 is completed, phase 2 is to extend the tunnel. So, again I am using an instrument to stabilize the globe through the side port. I am using a new crescent, this has to be very careful, new crescent. I do not create a paracentesis, uh, 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 peritomy, but I just go through the existing tunnel and then slice sideways in a circular motion on the sclera, reach the maximum width that I want which is at least 6.5 to 7 millimeters in this case or even larger because you do not want to have too much of uh, stress inside the bag and then go into the clear cornea. You need to have at least 1 to 2 millimeter of internal corneal lip to maintain the uh, wound integrity. Extend it with the keratome so that you maintain the internal corneal lip full and my preferred nucleus delivery technique in these situations is a visco expression because it ensures that the chamber is stable during this maneuver. I use a limbs forceps on the other side to give some counteraction. These are all uh, topical phacos. So, intracameral anesthetic is required during this time. Then uh, my new uh, IA and uh, uh, IOL implantation has to be performed with a little bit of additional care because you do not want to pull and extend the dialysis which you have carefully uh, not disturbed too much till this stage. So, in most of these kind of elderly potentially progressive zonulopathies, I prefer to leave a CTR ring inside. It is not going to stabilize uh, or prevent a progression, but in case there is a subluxation gross enough at a later stage, you can suture through the ring and stabilize the uh, IOL bag complex if required at a future date. So, uh, the IOL centration is maintained. I confirm that the lens is inside, the CTR is properly placed inside and uh, that is basically the end of the case. Uh, this kind of careful wound uh, extension can be uh, left as such. You just need to hydrate everything. Uh, or if you are not very confident, you can suture the main port and just make sure that there is no exposed sclera that the conjunctiva has not retracted. You can use cautery or just a suture if required. So, uh, so uh, Dr. Varun, uh, okay, uh, what, what are your takes on this conversion part? Will you shift to a new uh, incision or would you extend like this? Or what is your So, to answer words? your question, I am one of the few of my generation who actually learnt SICS first. So, I am very comfortable in converting the wound like Dr. Matthew <laughs> did because uh, like everyone could see that uh, uh, if you maintain the 2 millimeter internal lip and just extend it sideways, you can actually have a wound where you do not have to suture. Although, whenever I convert, I suture because that is what my teachers, teachers taught me. <laughs> It's always good to. Yeah, I too suture. I also suture. It's I always better. Hundred percent suture. Stitch in time saves nine. But yeah, uh, I would use the same port and extend both ways. There's a yeah, question from, from the Mukesh. audience. There's yeah. a question. Yes. So I wasn't sure that there was adequate uh, uh, subluxation initially, but once the uh, you, you can see that the uh, uh, rexus. So then, to get a rounder uh, 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 rexus, prevent mimosis, and also with the advantage of being able to suture the ring in case there is a subluxation at a later date, you can do it the other way. Also. Yeah, there is no harm. Actually, uh, having a bag empty and then getting the CTR in will be uh, technically easier. So it is better we put that in and then put the I O L so that it doesn't go through the these kind of Reiner model once and all. Haptic it can go through the haptic and all those. So why create more complications? So get your C T R in also fine. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so whether to convert or not, the basically decision what I make is if my FACO maneuvers would further uh, have effect on the zonular dehiscence or the zonular dialysis. If I know that the grade of the cataract and the maneuverability will further uh, increase the zonal dialysis then perhaps I would convert and if I am able to the cataract is not of very hard rate and the manipulations will be 
सेफ इनफ टू कीप द लेवल ऑफ एक्सटेंट ऑफ द जोनल रेलिसेंस देन पर हैप्स वी विल कंटिन्यू विद पेको एंड फुट अ सी टी आर एट एनी पॉसिबल स्टेज वुड बी ओके बट कंसिडरिंग द ग्रेड हार्ड ग्रेड कैटरैक्स पर हैप्स आई वुड स्टिल कन्वर्ट एंड ब्रिंग इट आउट Yes, Sony. Uh, my directed question is for vitrectomy. Yeah. Vitrectomy. Uh, would you do a pass plan of vitrectomy? And how much of anterior vitrectomy would you do? Because to continue with a phaco, you need a stable lens. Yes. So uh, please. Um, I think in this situation, in this particular situation where you have found the vitreous coming out the through a probable uh, dialysis. I think I will uh, I will not do a pass plan. I will go to the anterior port itself, and uh, once I make sure there is no vitreous. and then uh, we can go ahead with the uh, nucleus dialing the nucleus into the uh, because there is generally there is a tendency to keep on doing vitrectomy yeah, yeah. Uh, when the dialysis is more and you see lot of space continue on vitrectomy after yeah. some time you know you lose lot of anterior vitreous yes. anterior and vitreous is a big support for your whole lens yeah. so if you feel that it is over from the iris margin stop iris yeah. limit and stop and then put uh, viscote there so yeah. that it plugs that area off and don't approach that area yeah. and reduce our flow rate so that yeah. it doesn't suck on as uh, area um, areas surrounding this one yeah uh, regarding anyone? regarding matthew's yeah, yes. uh, incision uh, uh, it, it it shouldn't be attempted uh, by a person who occasionally does sics uh, it should be learned as a technique what he does i suppose he learned it in normal cases not in abnormal cases so once you are confident in a, uh, doing it in a very well planned uh, uh, surgery sics it's fine but uh, while you are converting here your heart in is, is in your mouth yes. so that that time if you try you will cut across the and do everything possible yes, sir, actually, yeah so unless you are confident yeah. uh, make yourself confident doing it in a planned sics i would suggest you go in for the other instance. that is what i have seen in western western courses they just do an ecc limbal open incision like they do an ecc and kind of they, they don't do something which they are not comfortable with so they don't uh, train in ss so SIC. they don't have a choice uh, excellent point sony come come forward no come forward there are seats Just, here uh, please come forward uh, what what i do is uh, a lot of my planned ss <coughs> i will do a phaco uh, 3.2 or 2.8 or whatever it is and then uh, instead of uh, doing a extended tunnel initially and then uh, this thing i will do a planned uh, phaco extend the tunnel like i have shown here and then implant a rigid lens into the back okay and since that practice is there and i have done that several thousand times in the past i am comfortable to do that during the time when there is a challenge so heart is not in the mouth my uh, this is a planned maneuver for me similarly uh, optic capture techniques should be practiced you place the lens into the sulcus then uh, dip the optic into the uh, through the rexus into the bag and then you can dial the haptics into the bag practice that so that when you need it on the time when you need it you are not doing it as a first maneuver so plan all these things practice all these things then it will become much more steady hands don't shake uh, bp is normal and hands will shake still hands will shake hands <laughs> is not a boy i will head okay jp sir final point uh, your yeah. points and one question also uh, what about anesthesia when you are converting yeah. to on topical patients yeah uh, 95% of my cases are topical so when it it's time to convert i give a small subconch of silocard i keep a silocard on my tro- tro- on my uh, trolley instrument trolley silocard is the one that is coming in 30 ml i autoclave for my own uh, satisfaction and keep there in a 5 cc syringe which is the size different from all other uh, syringes that are used on the uh, trolley so that we will identify that it is silocard will not inject it repeatedly unnecessarily so that is taken given 0.5 ml subconch in that area and i do slightly differently these days i do not extend like what matthew did i used to do that previously now i open up do a peritomic artery and then i put a separate scleral tunnel a scleral incision at the same location i don't go superiorly simply because i am very lazy and second of course it's also because i thought that area should be left virgin for a future trap in any any patient for that matter so it is always a separate incision scleral tunnel and then i put a 10 vicral suture to close this wound i always use sutures in all the all my cases where i convert that's all and i close the conjunctive also with the residual Uh, vital so just so the patient is 
very comfortable i keep the knot inside underneath so that it doesn't go on irritating wire curl switches are very the ends are very very irritating so please don't leave it exposed sir uh, uh, yes venkatesh will you do will you give a uh, subti knots in this cases will you give a subti knots or a subconjunctival where you go to cut the conjunctival subconjunctival is my preference it works uh, it works wonders just a point uh, 1 ml or point 2 ml what i do is i give point 1 ml inferiorly and superiorly and using a bud i just rotate it uh you know massage it all around 360 degrees i mean i want to make a comment about the your case uh then you notice the subluxation you put to iris hooks now while iris hook will support the edge of the rexes definitely it leaves the equator unsupported so as you're getting the nucleus fragments out right there will definitely be a tendency uh, because you're using pretty high vacuum 350 400 mm of mercury there will be a tendency for this equator to get sucked in and there will definitely be an extension so the million dollar question is how how soon should we implant a capsule tension ring so many people believe that an empty bag is the best time to implant but i i think that the minute you notice a uh, uh, subluxation you should implant it as early as feasible and possible and uh, because you're worried about the snagging so as you're trying to the two things happen <laughs> as you do a hand on hand technique of feeding in the ctr one is it may snag the edge of the capsular bag or the equator the second is it can make the zonal dialysis worse uh, if you are not carefully uh, you know feeding it in and for this i use this technique which was described in by dr uh, little john little who described the little's rescue technique brian and, little brian little brian little uh, uh, yeah. brian little uh so uh, in his i movies he had a series of 10 uh, uh, you know a video uh, chapters in i movies he described a technique called the fish tail technique of using it Hooked have any of you tried it so yeah it's very very nice and very good looking if you fold it like this the ring like this and hold it here and then put it in and let it open like this but our kind of rings in india many of them break if you do it like never this, works so in my hand we, we have to get it from outside and uh, the sometimes sometimes most of them break so with for want of time sorry about this we, we to continue on this uh, moving on to the third situation of an open pc so let's see this case uh, trauma soft cataract open posterior capsule and uh, soft cataract so uh, no big deal we'll think about it but then we'll have to uh, finish it clean so first i put my visco as regular stuff do not shallow the chamber and rexes most important to have the proper sized means less than 5 mm just less than 5 mm and central hydrodo section actually not required just for the sake of mobilizing a little bit i do a little bit of delineation but don't do aggressively at all so this is one way i take out the central nucleus so i go in with the i am not a bimanual user but just for the sake of creating the central bowl and to remove the central bowl i just rotate around and remove the central nucleus part which is which can be called a nucleus and after that either mechanical or visco dissection of the central epinucleus including the epinucleus i use this chopper of mine this is 2 mm long like a, a little finger bend down like this you can go from three directions and move along the uh, epinucleus uh, uh, nucleus junction and then mechanically keep moving see like this in different angles you can easily move all of them and then make them make it mobile so there is no pressure variation happening inside then i move back with my uh, coaxial ia and then go to the periphery and then again start uh, pulling from the periphery to mobilize all the cortex and at this point you can always do a visco dissection also underneath but i don't want to inflate or hyper inflate or hyper pressurize the bag at all and here the flow rate is very low flow rate is close to 16 18 or even lesser than that and then uh, finish off the epinucleus also leave the leave the uh, epinuclear bowl or the shell which is behind there and exchange instruments irrigating instruments only after filling the anterior chamber with uh, viscoelastic and after that going in for the final layer of uh, cortex and here again the aspiration flow rate and the vacuum is quite low and use the bimanual way catch it use the uh, irrigating instrument also to feed it in and then come to the central part last every time we switch or swap instruments fill up the anterior chamber and you know, keep it stable without letting the vitreous prolapse or shallowing shallowing and deepening both will extend 
the uh, capsule openings so towards the end we approach the either sides of this railroad kind of thing i'm lucky that uh, nothing dropped but in young patients the avf will be intact and uh, nothing just like that drops but any time this uh, the the uh, the the edges of the rent um, notches or there is a vitreous coming out stop and do vitrectomy so now that the multi piece lens goes into the sulcus and there is some sodium hyaluronate which is there in the avf also i do not aspirate that because we can deal all these later but then if you try to pull that now this is the optic capture which is happening into the rectus margin so it has to be this small to have a very effective capturing so after capturing one one side of the optic you can just irrigate under the iol a little bit so that you can get some part of the sodium hyaluronate out and later on whatever usually sodium hyaluronate does not cause uveitis and the iop part you can always treat uh, with uh, medications so this one completes that situation cleanly but always i also always am um, not lucky enough to not let uh, some of it drop inside so always i do these kind of cases in a vr room or when the vr surgeon is also in so that any time his help can be taken so over to you matthew so clinically uh, trauma etc but iatrogenic is another situation this is a patient you can see that uh, little uh, powdery material that is there in the lens material on one side this is uh, um, what do you call intravitreal uh, hydro or intravitreal delineation you can call it uh, uh, which has happened into the lens matter here you can see the uh, the highlighted area there in the square this is uh, again uh, post intravitreal where uh, the posterior capsule was damaged and uh, <coughs> Uh, in both the cases initial steps appear to be okay but then when the uh, pc opens up it is a very large like a posterior polar case that happens this uh, osurdex uh, in a, a secondary glaucoma patient uh, uh, with a rigid pupil so hooks you can nicely see the osurdex intralenticularly and it's a peripheral uh, rent there and this again is uh, another situation where we can have the problem all of them can be managed during faco i will use the next video to highlight the steps that we need to do uh, basically we are trying like in posterior polar cataracts to not use any hydro dissection hydro delineate if required but very gently without over inflation you want to do what is called as a primary rotationless in situ chop so no rotation no stress on the posterior capsule you do uh, the distal portion removal is easy the chops are easy the proximal area is a cross chop and the subincisional area you need to either uh, prolapse it manually uh, using the sinski or some amount of visco and then uh, once the rent area is uh, once everything is cleared you have identified the rent you need to be in a position to see if it is a small central rent whether you can convert that into a primary posterior capsular rexus and if that is possible then it doesn't matter what is the nature of the lens you can do a uh, iol in the bag but most of these cases it is preferable to have a multi piece lens because that is what will go into the uh, sulcus if required and to do an optic capture uh, here this is a good intact posterior rexus so i am placing that into the bag okay and you can see that round nice rexus in the center at the back so that's good uh, the two things uh, that need to be highlighted at this stage is to consider visco uh, visco support visco under the iol uh, under the nucleus fragment and uh, that seals the posterior uh, opening or uh, iol scaffold technique which will again do the same thing and uh, help us to complete the case okay so we'll uh, move fast uh, on to what we missed in these videos and what are your additional comments and what you will do differently we'll start from dr varun first and then uh, go 
Well, I think uh, uh, I would agree. I generally do what Dr. Matthew does. I do a rotationless job, and also something which you did that has not been described theoretically, but uh, you did it with an IA because it was soft cataract. But in these cataracts, if you're doing a phaco like you trench, you can just go in and eat off the endonucleus. So that does two things. One, uh, obviously, if the inevitable were to happen, the VR surgeon will just be picking up the epinucleus and not the nucleus as such. And second, it makes your uh, maneuver like the uh, dislodging of the epinucleus from the periphery easier so we always go for the endonucleus of course that will that will depend on the grade of the nucleus but go for the endonucleus finish it off and then deal with everything one by one and uh, like the case you showed was a ppc and a posterior capsule x is always preferable but in the hydrogenic ones actually uh, you have to find out once you go inside and uh, everyone who has access to a vr surgeon make sure you post it on the days that the vr surgeon is there because things can change all these cases looking right now are very elegant and very beautiful but here things can change in a matter of a second so i guess those are what uh, my two cents yeah yes uh, dr venkatesh in your case uh, you didn't do hydro delineation uh, it was just a little bit of a bolus so, injection which you should not I mean, have been done that's the only thing i would have done not have been, i won't do I mean, just yeah, for the sake of trying to do something you know don't do <laughs> yeah. but beautifully done both the cases <laughs> uh one thing about the uh, pre existing uh, pc rent it also depends on the duration how long it has been there if it has been longer uh, normally and then the anterior vitreous phase will be intact and uh, it will it will it does not extend margin is a fibrous margin is a fibrous so generally it is margin that lens touch video that i showed the fibrous margin yes that's actually quite uh, easy to manage easy to manage but the, the, the recent ones are more difficult and we have to be much more careful use more of uh, viscot etc and uh, be careful so jp sir yeah these cases should be managed like posterior polar cataract with pre existing uh, opening in the pc and what i usually do is i do not do hydro dissection delineation visco dissection or visco delineation or mechanical delineation initially after the rexis i go in with my phaco tip low parameters and eat up the nucleus as much as possible with the power not with vac with vacuum and make it thin bowl first so everything is intact there is no hydro dissection or visco dissection or delineation till that point at this point once you have only a thin bowl because you can actually see that posterior polar acts as the mark for uh, up to what depth you should go and then i use my uh, orocot uh, that is uh, contract in sulfate and go in and do four quadrant visco delineation lift up from all four quadrant with small quantity so that now we have a layer of uh, dispersive ovd between that uh, pc opening and the epinucleus now it is very easy to go in with low parameters and eat up the residual one and then go with always go with bimanual ia that is one point that he, he has shown bimanual ia because you are you will not go in and hydrate the vitreous more and bring up vitreous so if that if you do this in a very careful and controlled manner i am sure you will end up in good success another point is if then the cataract is total see some of these cases after intravital they come with total cataract so there then it's a little difficult actually you do not have all these supports around the chances of you pushing down material into the vitreous is very high so i generally bring up the nucleus because the nucleus will be loose in a fluffy like your mature cataract so lift it up and bring it into the anterior chamber and and then proceed like uh, keeping a scaffold and eating up uh, that is what i do if it's a total cat right yeah dr mukesh Want to add on something, please? Nothing, sir. Plugging with a viscoid, specifically viscoid, it helps a lot to keep the vitreous behind. And in your first case, there was almost no vitreous loss, so it lot depends if the vitreous is prolapsing or not, because that will completely change the dynamics, and then you'll have to do a lot of vitrectomy. In those cases where the vitreous prolapses in an open PC, you would go a pars plana, or you would do an anterior vitrectomy. is my question i have done pars plana vitrectomy only in three cases where i had my vr surgeon next to me and i told him you put the clip port 
I have never put myself a port. And so if you're not confident in doing that in a soft tie uh, with the PC wrench, I would not do it myself. But he did it for me. But then it, lo- it felt very nice. Uh, to go under two threat and do and it was feeling very nice. But then actually good enough. But then I don't think we should, in a condition like this, people who are not used to do a, doing a Pasplana uh, opening, please don't do. Nothing big about it. But actually it is good that you don't bring out more vitreous. It will cut there itself. All advantages of Pasplana vitrectomy is there. But then, f- uh, for the situation, for the for that particular surgeon's experience, please decide wisely. Choose wisely. And uh, so, sorry if uh, we have to stop this discussion here and move on. So, we'll move, move on to the... And the main point which I want to stress is everybody has been telling, flow rate and aspiration, minimum. Because that is what pulls out more vitreous. When you have IA and bimanual IA placed at a higher level not face towards the PC opening and above the iris so that it's in a different direction and doesn't involve the vitreous area and uh, aspirate each individual cortical piece going close to it, bringing it to the center and continuing the aspiration rather than creating a lot of, uh, it's not coming on, uh, creating a lot of uh, aspiration flow. Aspiration flow is very, very crucial. That's what, no, no, it's, it'll come usually just, just like that comes on. It was coming on like that when it goes into sleep mode. It was coming on. Aspiration cut, irrigation cut, aspiration. So, this is great because when you are dealing with cortex, you go into irrigation, aspiration and you do it like a correct uh, 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 conventional IA and go it deeper into position 3 only if you feel you have uh, caught some vitreous and uh, you want to get rid of the vitreous. So, you are doing IA mostly and deeper when there is vitreous presenting. But then when there is primarily vitreous presenting, you want to be in irrigation cut aspiration. So, you have very high cut rates and then you can switch toggle between the ICA, IAC uh, on your foot pedal itself. You don't need an assistant to fiddle with it. And this actually changes the dynamics of how well you can clean up the anterior chamber. Many times you will find that at the end of the surgery, uh, next day you are not able to distinguish a PC rent from a normal case. Just now when I was coming this side, uh, another senior person was asking me this IEA cut and cut IEA, what is all this? So, it's a little complicating if you, uh, in uh, modern machines like this, I would say in a vitrectomy, if you do irrigation, cut and aspirate, that is the vitrectomy setting which you should have. And aspirating and cutting is for just aspirating the cortex after you do vitrectomy. But then in the third level, there is vitrectomy. So, if you are aspirating close with the capsule somewhere, and you accidentally go into vitrectomy when you are full with vacuum, you suddenly cut the capsule off. So, I said you forget about that second this thing. Don't swap instruments, don't change. Go to the IA mode. If you want to just aspirate cortex, just get the IA mode. And if vitreous comes in, go back to the irrigation, cut and aspiration mode alone. Don't confuse yourself when there is a complicated situation like a PCR and you are doing vitrectomy. So, moving on, aniridia IOL. Um, when you have this kind of a situation... So, um, oh, sorry. Okay. So, this is the anaeradia rigid IOLs which is available. Sometimes we need uh, in some cases like this. They come with aphakia. They uh, don't have um, iris at all. So, I used to use uh, 90 uh, proline before. Nowadays, I don't use it. I use Gore-Tex. So, this is a single point fixation. One, one uh, two um, eyelets are there. You can tie it on and go just like your scleral fixation. I use all, still use a flap. And underneath the flap, uh, you uh, place the eye hole inside. You need a large opening here. There is a lot of scarring there on the limbus. That's why a clear corneal cut has been made. You can make always... Um, uh, scleral tunnel also but it needs at least a 10 millimeter opening to get this one in remember the haptics are very fragile and they sometimes if you pressurize it or hold it tight it may just break off after you do most of the things it may just break off so beware of the with the thinness of the haptic optic junction and don't manipulate this like regular ios and uh, uh, like your regular skull fixation you can finish this i just wanted to bring in the point that uh, these lenses are available these are good Patients don't have much of glare, but then beware of, you always have, I always get two lenses and one keeps one in standby. In this case also, I had one haptic breaking and I had to take another one. So, don't just have one IOL, please have two IOLs with you. This is the 70 Gore-Tex, which I am using for all these scleral fixations now. Uh, difficult to, there is a technically, it is a little difficult with the, with the needle, which is not meant for... Uh, 
uh, railroading like a long straight needle it's a stumpy curved needle so it is a little difficult to railroad but the technique is little uh, cumbersome to show you uh, it can be done in a course which deals with only this but here it's a two point fixation you make the loop go through the uh, eyelets and there are two points where you have gone underneath the flap and here also don't struggle like this don't make the incision 1.15 mm lesser make it a 0.5 larger so that the lens is not pressurized and it goes in smoothly and then don't let this entangle you know you see where the loops are there for the particular haptic and don't let it entangle what if it is entangled and the lens goes inside it's very very difficult to uh, disengage those uh, uh, ones and then i make a 2 uh, 3 1 1 uh, suture knot and make sure that it is under the flap and the flap is thick enough and the flap is close to it because these kind of uh, so these suture it is very thick and if it uh, erodes out it is very uh, very awkward ugly it erodes out through the conjunctiva you will have to do a patch graft over it and so have this one completely and again tie it don't not lock the knot uh, initially tie both sides see the centration and then lock it later Uh, with a three one one knot, and I always close the flaps also with a ten zero proline or uh, nylon, and uh, this will prevent this uh, Gore-Tex from being uh, uh, eroded out because Gore-Tex is a very very useful. It doesn't break. See, after seven years, after ten years, your uh, proline will break. Mostly will break. Ten zero if you use ten zero nine zero may hold on for longer, but this one will not break. But this needs a little learning curve on how to use it because if you Uh, there are different uh, that that will take a long time to describe on that but then you will also be showing on okay moving on to uh, matthew's case on um, anaeradia rings when you have the bag also in yes so uh, one of the challenges to doing uh, anaeradia patients is photophobia so you see the image is quite dark i use as low illumination as possible because these people will not be able to tolerate it they also have uh, other associated abnormalities it is not just the absence of the iris so other associated abnormalities will be present so giving subtenance etc can be associated with lot of bleeding most of these patients will have uh, soft cataracts so the initial steps of surgery are not much of a challenge the this is just speeded up i this is not my normal uh, uh, this thing this is not tremors also okay please note <laughs> okay uh, so at this stage uh, the iol goes in i prefer to implant the uh, lens and then do the uh, uh, ctr in this kind of situation because the ctr itself is quite bulky and this has got this very special angled uh, it's called the ski uh, like for skiing you have those uh, things got that very angled thing and this prevents the uh, uh, capsular bag from getting hooked in at any stage you can see that uh, the alternate areas which are dark are fairly large and struggle to go through a 2.8 it needs to be extended to 3.2 so it uh, reduces the uh, once it is inside the bag it reduces uh alternate areas by approximately uh, 3 plus 3 6 mm so one ring is inadequate you need to, to uh, put two rings and that's why i like to have the iol in the bag because uh, that will keep the pc uh, clear also and the square edge is uh, reducing long term pcos the second one has to go in and once the second one goes in you need to uh, make sure that they don't overlap and you adjust it and titrate it and hold it such that there is a side to side uh, uh, interlocking kind of thing so that those open gaps are cleared a uh, point which minu not uh, made is that these things are also not very frequently used so from the manufacturer side also these things tend to be stale and break so that one is broken anyway uh, it was implanted and lo and behold the second one is broken okay so these are actually uh, need to be manipulated with care because now the broken edge is sharp so if you do, uh, if you go anti clockwise there you can actually create the rent and that will cause the problem okay so this is very crucial that which company did you buy this one uh, 
the second one i think is from uh, iocare uh, no no so, first uh, the broken one is uh, iocare the second uh, the it is not one. that iocare one breaks uh, every every one every uh, one of this breaks so so it is not uh, iocare's no no financial interest in, but then the um, mosher one Mosher I, I think one, the first one is Mosher. Mosher, or, uh, Mosher German one. Uh, it it stays, but it is very, 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 very costly, and it takes time to get it. Mm, yeah. So yes, yes. Uh, Pardon? Why is it Why is it not continuous? That is actually a good question. That's a good question. Okay, but I have not seen anything which is continuous. Only on the Aniridia IOLs, you get that continuous band in the periphery. Um, Maybe it's difficult to maneuver. Once it is a thick and full band, no, you cannot tilt it too much and uh, or turn it and flex it and all yeah, those. Yeah, yeah, that's flex. 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 It will not flex bonus. that easily. The flexion will not be there. Yeah. Okay. So yes, yes, comments, please. Come yeah, please. Uh, these materials are actually very brittle. Uh, that is something which we really have to keep in mind while using these uh, uh, instruments. And uh, to answer your question, it has alternate rings because otherwise it won't curve. It'll just break when you're implanting. So you can't flex it that much to get it in through an exactly, opening. Like exactly. This. Yes, Sony, you're brimming to tell something, please. Yeah. Uh, when even I have implanted broken ones, it's very, it's very dangerous because the edges will be very sharp. And usually it happens uh, second when you put the second one and you try to you know engage it into the alternate this thing. So one has to be really careful. Uh, probably I would prefer going for a larger incision and putting the NRD IOL rather than doing this. So keep. Uh, things stand by buy more and have standby ones anybody in the audience with any experience or knowledge of uh, artificial iris no but uh, the brittle bit is uh, true <laughs> i have one experience me know yes sir. there was long time back maybe 20 years uh, two rings uh, from iok and Rolly, which i implanted the most important point is to wash out all the o ovd from the bag this is very crucial because even after surgery two three months that I, uh, this uh, ring can rotate. Mm -hmm. So the clear areas come, become exposed. So this is very important. I had a patient where I implanted two rings, mm -hmm. very nicely placed. I was very happy, but came after three months, the, one of the rings has rotated. So there was multiple gaps all around. I, went, I had to go in to re-dial uh, that ring and get it in place. That is one experience that I have. So it's very important. Like toric lenses, you have to take out all the OVD if you ever implant such a uh, device in the back. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, two more topics to come. This is uh, recentering uh, IOLs. So I will just come to my case. This is a single piece IOL in the bag, decentered grossly and uh, not dilated much. But then on tilting, we can see the CTR also there. In this one. So, uh, anybody remembers this happy face before? Uh, that, this is the same case. <laughs> this is the same case. So, uh, initially I will show CTR, lens is well centered, happily go away. After some time, they'll come back to you only and say, I can't see well, then it's like this. God help you. So, anyway, uh, we can always tell that your lens is not stable and all those we have to recenter your lens. You are not stable, your lens is not stable. All so, you rubbed it, did you rub your eye and all those things. But then, uh, <laughs> you know, and then finally say uh, that we will fix it. So, first of all, visualization, very important. So, I put iris retractor hooks and see what is happening in the periphery, see the bag properly. So, once you see, uh, the bag properly, I fill it up with uh, viscote or sodium hyaluronate, up to you. So, I uh, put it on uh, in the in the anterior chamber and also in the AVF. The good thing is that there is no vitreous now in the, um, uh, in the anterior chamber. So, I don't want to have vitreous coming out and also I don't want needles going through vitreous. So, needles are going to be used. So, it is better if you have a, um, a visco behind the lens also pushing the anterior vitreous face down. And so mark exactly 180 degrees and then create the flaps, not after that. And then flaps, I still love flaps. So I want all my sutures, everything under flaps. So everything coming out is not a great. See, so now just like your scleral fixation, see two needles, 27 gauge needles, one needle piercing the scleral bed and then going underneath the haptic optic, ideally the haptic optic junction or if the lens is attached somewhere and is not fully free, then you can uh, just use the haptic and the CTR again helps. Even if there is no CTR, it's okay. And then the needle, uh, 90 proline needle comes from the opposite paracentesis and pierces the bag. You can even pierce the bag with the 27 gauge needle also. And then railroad and bring it out. 
so the other end other needle the, this needle is a both sides are, are needles and the other end comes above the haptic uh, the haptic and the ctr so there is a loop which is looping the ctr and the haptic so comes out in one side and do repeat the same on the other side then center it well and don't tighten one side initially itself otherwise it will get decentered to uh, one corner so then make like i said before make one three knot three throws and then uh tighten on both sides and see and titrate the tightness and then lock it with your uh 211 or 11 and after that uh, you can uh, center this and nowadays i do all cases with gotex this was done 3 4 years back so shifted on to gotex completely so matthew will show this one is um Oh, no, 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 but double CT is next. E this one, ph ph phimosis. This one, phimosis, like that again aggravates the further decentration. Yeah. So if you have some area without zonules and some area with intact zonules, and the sex is small, there is a lot of area to phimos, and it further pulls this bag away from the area of dialysis, and you get more of decentration. I don't try to do anything primarily. I wait for about two, three weeks, uh, and then I will just do one or two shots on the thing uh, because, see, you finished everything. it looks good and then you try to be perfect then oh my god i okay. have i have lost a rexus trying to extend it after i had sutured a cony ring and okay. centered everything but the rexus looked a little small okay let us make it big made a cut and that just tried it in a dunk and it went into the periphery and it's gone okay. that's gone so like that sometimes it may happen but many times if you are controlled and if you make a, a, a from the rexus margin if you make an angulated cut rather than making a radial cut like this then you can proceed with the tear a little more controlled rather than making a, a radial cut like this please make it okay so here is a case uh, this is uh, ctr you can see the edge of the ring there you can see there is fair uh, amount of subluxation there and uh, i use visco dissection and create space and this is a capsular tension ring that is going in the primary implantation of the ctr did not prevent the uh, progressive luxation so here there is that one uh, eyelet which is going to be in front and just like uh, minu showed now you are going in i don't use flaps i use uh, pouch i now push the uh, iol bag complex posteriorly with visco so that the 26 bent 26 needle has space to come in railroad the straight needle and take it uh, back out and uh, again under the pouch uh, i do the second uh, uh the uh, double arm suture second of the double arm suture goes is railroaded through and taken so now what has happened is basically this uh, loop of uh, double arm suture 90 proline uh, has got uh the cts threaded through that so there is a arc which goes into the bag to the equator now i have made a mistake of tying it you could see that the lens is moved a little more temporarily i had planned only for one because that is the area of uh, maximum luxation the other area looked okay but since the bag is pulled that side i now decide to uh, improve the centration by putting a second one same identical thing on the other side so this gentleman i call as my third time lucky patient because primarily i did the ctr secondarily i did this double cts with uh, proline and uh, after some time he came back and smiled at me and said i am not seeing anything so because in trying to uh, in trying to center the iol now what i have done is i have put a fair amount of tension on my 90 proline so normally 90 proline will take several years to uh, degrade but this one took less than 9 uh, months to degrade so then uh, uh, after this happened i i am able to get that out and i now do a in situ fixation with gortex this is where you will see the fairly large needle which is chunky and uh, i explant that uh, cts out of the bag this could dissect when you have so many things inside the bag there is very little chance that uh, the bag will properly fibros and you are able to visco dissect and open it uh protect the endothelium prolapse this out if you can speed it up a little bit that will be better okay 
and uh, that is Gore-Tex, thread it through the eyelet, take it out on the other side railroading it. It is fairly cumbersome because you can see that it is a large needle and it is thick and it is not a very sharp curve, but it is a shallow curve and uh, then I tie it. Uh, and the principle is the same and then after some time important thing that Minu mentioned was that you need to bury it properly because this gentleman came back after some months to my cornea colleague who was not aware of the stories that had happened in the past and one of the cornea people said it looks this bulky thing that is there. He thought it was a conjunctival granuloma and scraped it off and the goat. So, we had to fix it again. Because it looks new and white and all, no? So, it goes to somebody, somebody else, they, they do not think of Gore-Tex which is white and uh, thinks that there is some granulation, some uh, infiltration and all those and they pull it off. So, that can happen. So, please mention it is Gore-Tex if, if you do something and give it to the patient so that others also know. See, there is a video which you can see Dr. Chisum fake available in this one. It is a suture snare technique which I use nowadays, it is very effective, little time consuming, but then rather than using this stumpy needle, which is very difficult to pass it through and then railroad, cut off the needles and make a snare. It is very easy to make a snare, you can just thread the tip into a 27 gauge needle and then keep this one out, you have one long thread coming out, put it inside and then snare it out. It is difficult to explain, but it is easy to understand if you see the video in YouTube. I, if you had time, we could have shown that, but then such a snare can pull these two loops easily without any uh, needle. Yes, please. Mukesh will start with Mukesh you. Mukesh, start, please. <laughs> in uh, your case that uh, you had shown that uh, you had fixated the same IOL, in case, uh, are there any cases where you would like, if there is a too much subluxated or if you are not able to scleral fix it, you have primarily gone in for an uh, iris claw or any other secondary IOLs, SF IOLs in these cases. If there is too much fibrosis, if pseudo exfoliation and at a later date they come up with absolute dehiscence. Remember, there is thing that there is one more person standing here, he would definitely say, I will take out the whole complex out and still fix it. Or I will put a, or put a uh, thing. So, that is what I wanted to get from all of you, that there is another th third one, which will say that it will save all these uh, gymnastics and uh, give a, a similar, equally good uh, thing. No, no, thing is how how uh, comfortable are you with the technique? That is most important. So, if you have done enough uh, iris claws and if you feel that the iris claw is fine with you, I would say please go ahead with uh, do, doing iris claw. If I, I feel that it is the um, um, I do I don't do iris claw lenses, I do all glued IOLs. So, I am comfortable with doing glued IOLs in any case. So, if such a case without uh, too much of maneuvering, you can put two sutures and center them, fine. I would not open up, I would not take out. There is a lot of trauma going into the opening up and then cutting it and taking out and the maneuvers are too many. It's a second surgery, third surgery and all. So, if such a case, you want a closed system and if you want just two threads going in and looping it and holding it on, I would I, I would select that. But then, if it is too much and if it is subluxating too much, taking you, uh, straining you, you get a BP high for a long time. Where you feel it is more comfortable like in place. In this case, there was a there was CTR there. There were two CTS. There was the IOL and Point port surgery, and still we are fixing the bag. Be See, very the, easy the thing to is, pull it out. There's a whole yeah. stuff there. No? Yeah, so, so, the, the thing is, retaining the retaining the um, internal anatomy as such without disturbing opening up too much has its own advantages. That you don't get out vitreous. You don't do further vitrectomy. You center the whole thing. You don't open up too much. Uh, um, closing the incisions. All those things are there. So, if possible, retaining the bag is considered by one is as a school of thought uh, retaining the bag is uh, one of the uh, most ideal things to do so that is one explanation i can give which is not a very uh, <laughs> very ideal explanation always fixate both ends i mean once i saw a patient a distant relative where there was only luxation of the bag oil complex on one side the other side seemed intact so i just fixated one end and he came six months later with the other end dangling. So always, even if you see that there is a luxation only on one one side, make sure you fix it both. I, I think the key take home message when you are doing uh, suturing on both sides is to titrate the tension, make sure it is appropriate, well centered before you put in the knot. 
you tie off one side and if it is not perfect then you are finished ok. I think I could have avoided uh, the Gore-Tex as well as the subsequent surgeries for this individual if I had done that ok. So, all these things you have to play it in your mind before you actually start operating because when that happens you have thought this through when you are trying to create the plan on the wing as you are operating is when uh, things go wrong there is no substitute to good planning experience is not going to work. So, the, this tension on the suture is very very crucial we think that we need to tighten it and pull it and all those you do not need that kind of a once this is inside it itself centers if both sides are there it centers quite well and you just need it just the tightness to hold it on there. You do not have to pull it with the needle, with the suture and uh, st um, um, so coming back to your question itself, glue diver. Next, skill fixation. Uh, do not do not do all these gymnastics and do only uh, whatever is comfortable. I have Dr. Venkatesh in the audience. Dr. Venkatesh, <laughs> in <laughs> increase incidence of glaucoma in uh, SFI oils. Hmm? Okay, so let us see how we will do it properly. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, we should also, uh, we should so also keep cystoid macular edema in mind. So, if there is a physiological barrier, barrier then all these Barrier effect is lesser. very crucial, yeah. it is quite important. So, uh, let me go on to the last one. Uh, glue dial is my choice. So, this uh, measuring the white to white is the first thing and the most important thing. So, many cases nowadays that they are all coming more than 11.5, most of many people whom I measure. So, uh, please measure and uh, see the size of your eye oil and if they are more than 11.5, I would choose a vertical location so that you can have a uh, shorter white to white. So, this is another instrument which marks 180 degree and the flap area also. Here I am just trying to see which is longer. And then uh, creating a flap, my, my personal uh, option, flap is very important. I like flaps. So, 2, two mm and 3 mm. 2 mm wide and 3 mm long. So, that you can have the knot go very well inside. Dissecting up to the tunnel, up to the uh, cornea is not ne necessary. But it is important if you want to have it flat on the cornea just like that instead of an assistant holding and pulling the flap. If you want to see clearly. Otherwise, if you make a small one, uh, it will just fall back and you will have to struggle with another hand to pull it up and all those. Otherwise, this will lay flat on the cornea if you dissect till the limbus. So, my infusion is nowadays if it is with the uh, VR surgeon, it is possible, na, but otherwise uh, it is this. Now, I have changed to trocar cannula because many times this can be either loose or very tight and it can come out. Now, this is a, a 22, 21 gauge uh, forceps which was going in which I used to use previously. Now, I have changed to a 23 gauge and uh, make uh, openings 2 millimeters behind the anterior limbus and this forceps is uh, custom made forceps which is uh, which has very good grasp Go use good ones not just the capsule forceps which you regularly use C catch at the tip don't leave it and let the whole optic come inside i use uh, nowadays uh, orolab three piece lenses and sensor previously i used to do alcon lenses also stopped using that and then take out one one haptic. Now it is fixed with a, a stopper here so that you do not need an assistant to hold it. I will just show you that later. Then by the handshake technique, bring the second haptic inside, hold it a little away so that the tip is free and then go in through the, see somebody else is holding my flap there and go in and hold at the tip and exterior, exterior rise. Uh, take some time, hold at the tip only and hold tight. Once it is coming out, many times only the forceps will come out. Then you will have to struggle and get the, the dry haptic again. So, once nowadays once it comes out, I just put it into the chariot's pocket which I will show you in the next case. And uh, do not tuck in too much. 1.52 millimeters is more than enough because otherwise the other side you cannot tighter. One, once you put both sides inside, then you can adjust and re-tuck re so that the centration is good. Make sure that the uh, look at the Purkinje images which fall on the cornea and the IOL and they should be they should match when they match they should be in the center of the optic and now I hydrate this suture may not be required but some cases I put suture uh, may not be needed hydrate very well paracentesis and the main incision and after that take your irrigation out and put in an air bubble so that it uh, too much of fluid is not there sometimes this may be leaky so uh, wait for some time and then uh, put the glue there glue doesn't help in any way just to close the this one suture less but I nowadays sometimes put a suture also there on the on the flap and conjunctiva and can also be closed with the uh, uh, glue 
which again uh, pointless i i i still put one suture because many times i feel that i, I see that right. the uh, conjunctiva retracts and exposes this is the acm which i now use um, regular one which is it is very long so be careful that it doesn't hit on the cornea or the other limbus point towards the center this nay stays snugly fit that is one important thing second thing is now i use this uh, the the 26 gauge needle or even a 1 mm keratom also can be used go 2 to 3 mm into the deep enough because many times you are scared that you will perforate but if you are very superficial your your after 3 months your sclera your haptic will be outside under the conjunctiva or depending okay. on this is how i put in the um stopper which is loaded on to a 27 gauge needle and that is transferred on to the haptic then it stays there the, you manipulate the other side whatever way you want doesn't come out and this if you had seen uh, it is a pvdf haptic it doesn't break sometimes i have had the haptics breaking uh, while trying to um, tuck it into the flap and then i constrict the pupil and put an air bubble and see whether there is an optic capture May, many times there is iris capture optic capture and the iris falls behind and you it on the you see it on the next day so nowadays i have stopped putting this uh, retaining this air and also if you, you see that on the table i do a pupilloplasty with a, a sft Uh, so that uh, the pupil is smaller than the uh, optic always and i don't dilate also initially but many sometimes if you leave the air bubble the superior it goes superior and pushes the iris back and you get an optic capture and then you have to make the patient sit and then dilate and turn him like this and go back take back to the theater and all this clumsy so uh, use uh, pupiloplasty sutures moving on uh, matthews technique so i prefer sutured uh, technique uh, i've been doing that for years uh, with uh, fair degree of comfort uh, 180 degrees apart i make my uh, conjunctival peritomy and then i don't do ho classic hoffman pockets but i make pockets from the scleral side and uh, uh, typically the dissection starts at uh, 3.5 mm posterior to the limbus and i dissect halfway at least to the cornea so that uh, the needle entry will be at uh, 1 1.5 mm behind the limbus i use the acm i think that is one of the most critical things to prevent uh, post operative complications if you use visco it will remain there if you use uh, uh, if you don't use anything there will be uh, choroidals in the post operative period the railroading is fairly simple has been described earlier but you must make sure that it is exactly 180 degree uh, opposite each other just below and just above the 0180 degree meridians to ensure that the iol is well centered so i do uh, from the right side because i am right handed i thread the double armed uh, 90 proline and take it out from the left hand side cut the suture material exactly in the middle and uh, there is uh, uh, both the uh threads are introduced through the eyelet and you have to take lot of uh, knots typically it is 333 knots which i use uh, because the proline is very uh, slippery make sure that uh, you do not entangle it thread it through the other uh, eyelet as well and then knot it securely and again these haptics tend to break so that the manipulation that you do has to be very carefully done at this point is where the uh, you have to keep track of the suture material so that it doesn't entangle you have to do like a deep dive enter into the anterior chamber dip downwards put the leading haptic into the 6 o'clock position trailing haptic is introduced and then the rest of it is tied uh, is just a matter of so tying the knot as you tighten the knot with appropriate tension the knot slips under the pocket and remains buried uh, firmly the conjunctiva needs to be pulled back and closed either with glue or with a suture if required so session session ends in 5 minutes 1 minute 1 uh, minute concluding remarks from each of our expert panelists please dr mukesh first i usually uh, do the sutured way uh, less of the glued iols and also the the modified technique where uh, 
uh the yamanese technique is also there where they kind of uh, bulb they make a bulb using a cautery there and uh, glue it up that also can be an additional uh, thing to do in these uh, glue dyers in spite of the fact that we have uh, gone into more and more complex looking surgeries um in refixing lens or in putting in a lens without a uh, capsule or support uh there is no evidence at this point of time to say that this is better than an iris claw or an iris fixated or an a well done anti ray chamber eyewear so if um, uh, people among you who don't have access or who are not experts putting in an ac eyewear but correctly will give you excellent results that is one point i want to tell yeah uh, just like dr jp said uh it depends on your experience and your uh, if you are good at a particular technique uh, then go ahead with that i have uh, i am a fan of iris glow lenses uh, they do very well and uh, scleral fixation and glue dye will definitely and like he said uh, most of the complications of an aci will happen because of the surgery which precedes rather than the aci will a well kept aci will also can uh, do a good job but having said that a uh, 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 posterior chamber location of the iol will be much better so it is such a diols for me because i don't like pulling out the haptic from within out of the sclera and i also now tending to move towards uh, iris claw find them very comfortable to use So I prefer the scleral uh, fixated sutured eye oils as well, and uh, I prefer flaps, like you said. So it's always nice to visualize what you're doing, and you can be sure of it. And like Sir said, always best to titrate the pressure so that you know that it's not tilting or going away in one direction. Incidentally, Soumya is winner of the ESCRS award on uh, refixing uh, dislocated lenses a <laughs> uh, couple of years back. <laughs> I think everyone's covered everything. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you everyone Mino, thank uh, you this was a good session uh, thank you for coming thank you all the panelists thank you thank you matthew <laughs>